computing. I do a lot of it. That's my job and what I'm mostly interested in. In this video, I'm gonna go over the way that I do said computing across my different devices, what software I use, and even a little bit of dark magic. Why would I care about that, you may be asking? Well, here's the answer. For one, I wanna demystify what it looks like for a technologist to do their personal computing. Additionally, I wanna break down a couple of barriers and prove that I, as a person who's actually interested in tech, can use basically whatever to do what I wanna do. I also generally spend a lot of time tinkering with my setup, and so maybe somebody will learn something from this and get some inspiration to upgrade their own. I will be breaking this video down into three parts. The first part will be my devices, the second part will be the software that I tend to use, and the third part will be dark magic. Dark magic is gonna be the stuff that's like, mm, I wanna tell you about this, but I don't expect you to understand it if you're not already into tech. Not to say that I don't think you could learn it and benefit from it and, be perfectly fine, but it's called dark magic. Part one, devices. Gonna start with phone, because that's, that's a lot of what computing is these days. So I used Android from like 2009, maybe, all the way up until like earlier this year, maybe late last year. I wanna make it clear, I didn't just use Android. I was a avid Android fanboy. I argued constantly that Android was better than iOS and I was completely insufferable to be around. I apologize to anyone who knew me back then. To make a very long story quite short, I progressively got myself off of pretty much all Google products. I do not trust Google to maintain a service for more than two years, and I'm tired of having to hop between all their chat apps and services and whatever, so I got out. I couldn't do it anymore. Additionally, iOS has come a long way. Uh, a lot of the features that I like from Android are now available on iOS. It has things that bug me, Absolutely for sure, but in general, my experience having gone from Android for over a decade to iOS, I am happier with iOS now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. So specifically, I have an iPhone 13 Pro Max. The reason I have that is because it has a ridiculously big battery life. It lasts for like multiple days without a charge. Uh, and then also the camera quality, which I didn't actually get the phone specifically for the camera, but I'm very happy that I have it because the camera is pretty good uh, and I use it for all of my recording. So that's convenient. Plus the fact that I can throw a lot of like complex computational stuff at this phone. It's got a good chip in it and I can do pretty significant video editing right on my phone. I can record, edit, and post entire videos without ever leaving one device. That's, that's pretty awesome. Also, just having more screen real estate and having a decent device that you can depend on is nice when phones are increasingly the thing that we turn to the most. I absolutely reach for a full desktop computer experience when I need to do serious work. But if I'm laying on my couch, I don't... I don't want anything else. I want a little handheld device I can poke at. Let's talk desktop. My desktop setup is a little bit extra. Here's a picture of it. Boop. I don't need a screen that big, uh, but I like it. <laughs> I spent a long time having multi-monitor setups and the seam always kind of bugged me. So I just sprang for a ridiculous monitor and it's honestly really nice. I actually have about the same amount of screen real estate as if you had two 27 inch 1440p monitors. And what I do is treat it as sort of three monitors, one big one in the middle and two on the side. So I can have my main focus program in the middle and then two programs flanking it, usually like Discord and a web browser. My desktop is a custom designed build. I did not build it myself. I use a company called Digital Storm. They're kind of pricey, but they do pretty good uh, evaluations and testing and they earned me as a lifelong customer when many years ago I, I designed a PC on their website. They built it and tested it. They found that the cooling wasn't good enough and they upgraded it for free. And I was like, well, thank you. That's awesome. It's a beefy machine. I'm not going to lie. I spent a lot of money on it, but that's the thing that I invest in in my life. That's the thing for me. Uh, so it's got a ridiculous graphics card. It's got a 3080. Uh, it's got a ton of memory. It's got a ridiculous chip. It's, it's, it's too extra. It's more than I need. Uh, but I wanted to get something that was going to be future proof, at least for a little while. And that's what I got. And I really like it. I use my desktop for all of my serious computing stuff. If I'm doing serious programming, if I'm doing serious editing, photo editing, video editing, or whatever, if I need to do work that really requires me to focus, I'm gonna have my ass in a chair, I'm gonna be at my big monitor, I'm gonna be using the power of the computer that I paid for, uh, and that's, that's just the way I like it. I like having access to a big, beefy computer to tackle big professional tasks. Time for some controversy. I have a phone and I have a desktop. In the middle, is a laptop, right? Maybe a tablet? Well, what if I use a tablet as my laptop? 
I spent many, many, many years of my life having a desktop or a laptop, and then I started having a desktop and a laptop. And the main thing that bugged me was both of them had to be sort of in workstation mode at all times so that I had continuity that I wanted. I had the desktop, which had all the programs that I wanted, all my data, all my everything. I would go to my laptop and be like, wow, this just feels like a hampered version of my desktop. Why don't I just go to my desktop? And then there have been times where I had primarily a laptop and that was my main workstation. But then I was like, oh, this doesn't have all of the power that my desktop could have if I had a nice desktop. So what do I do? It turns out increasingly I do not care about having a full desktop grade operating system with me in laptop format. If I'm doing serious work, I probably need to sync in at my desk anyway. And if I'm on the go, I probably don't need all the extra cruff that comes with a desktop operating system. Enter the iPad Pro. When Apple started actually pushing the iPad to be a little bit more powerful, having a bona fide file system, and increasing the real power that they're putting into these things with the M1 chip and whatnot, I mean, yeah, it's actually kind of getting pretty close to a computer experience. So I got an iPad and I got one of those like keyboard cases. Hold on, actually. Here it is. It's effectively a laptop. Like this thing closes like a laptop. It's a little clunky to open, honestly, but once it's like open and sitting there, this keyboard is honestly pretty great. <laughs> it's better than some of the previous MacBooks I've had. Uh, it's got a, ta a trackpad that actually is very, very good. And it's also a full touchscreen and a beautiful screen at that. And it's really quick. It's so much faster than having a laptop and opening it and getting to the login screen and logging in, letting everything kind of like boot up a little bit. This thing is just like a phone. You tap it and it's ready to go. You click an app, it's there. Additionally, that case has a plug on the base of it. So I still have a free plug on the iPad itself and it can charge through the case, which is sick. I just plug it in like a laptop and it just sits there. When I want to take it on the go, it's great. I've been playing games on it too. Like you can connect a, a Bluetooth controller to it and play video games. You can even run Steam Link on it. So I can run games from my desktop, my gaming desktop over my network and play anywhere in my house from my iPad. And then native games too. Like I've been playing a ton of Minecraft and you just connect a controller and it, it really does just work in this case. And another point for the iPad, uh, my go-to video editor for the majority of my stuff is LumaFusion. It's an iOS app. It runs perfectly well on the iPad. It crashes a bunch, but oh well, it's a great form factor. So yeah, I mean, when I'm doing mobile computing, I'm typically writing, chatting, watching, like I'm not often doing hardcore coding. And when I do, I have a solution for that. That's gonna be in the black magic section. So device recap. I have an iPhone and an iPad. I am able to have those talk to each other via like, you know, cloud sync crap, uh, an airdrop that's really convenient for just sending files back and forth. Then I have my desktop computer that is Windows. It's definitely a pain to have the walled garden of iOS and then a Windows machine. That is absolutely a pain. I can have some stuff move over, but yeah, I do wish there was better integration there. That's a shortcoming, absolutely. But I love my workstation PC. It's really powerful and I can play any kind of games on it. Wouldn't exchange it. Part two, software. The number one piece of software that I stand, and it's rare for me to stand software as a software developer because it's mostly bad, Obsidian. Obsidian.md is the website. Obsidian is a note-taking app that is just, it hits all the marks. The only thing it has going against it is that it's an Electron app, but I can't really hold that against them because that opens up a lot of opportunities. Why is Obsidian so great? Well, Obsidian, first of all, is local first. All of your files are saved on your computer as plain text files. If you ever don't have access to Obsidian, if Obsidian ever goes away, if you ever can't use Obsidian in the future, you still have every single note you've ever taken in a perfectly universal format. On top of that, Obsidian has a whole bunch of features that you would really want from a great note-taking app. Linking between notes, automatically updating those links when the title of a note changes, daily notes and all that kind of good stuff, like periodic entries into a journal. The list goes on and on and on and on and on, honestly. You can embed notes into other notes. You can do all sorts of visualizations of your entire journal and see all the connections between your notes. It's really awesome. But the real magic kicks in when you enable community plugins. Just like a web browser, people can make add-ons for Obsidian and that extends its capabilities endlessly. You can have an entire Kanban board like Trello. You can do advanced calendar management. You can even run code inside of Obsidian to query your notes and create a table of relevant notes based on what you've written elsewhere. It's, it's endless possibilities. Obsidian is an amazing piece of software. Obsidian is also free, which is awesome. 
Uh, there are paid services that you can get. They have a internal sync service and also a service to publish your notes as a website. Those do cost money, but they're completely optional. And you don't need to use their sync service. You can have, since it's all in, in plain text files, you can just throw your Obsidian Vault into any cloud service, like Google Drive or whatever, and that works too. And that works on mobile as well. I can make an entire video series about Obsidian, so I'm gonna move on. Email! It's boring, but we do need to use it. And email is honestly a really great thing. Email is a perfect example of how we can have old internet technologies that stand the test of time. Email is a protocol, it is not an app. It is a way for us to communicate with each other over the internet that everyone has agreed upon. Email providers, however, have largely centralized this service. I'm thinking Gmail, Yahoo, whatever. They basically rebranded email as their own thing. Additionally, a lot of these email hosts don't charge you money because you are the product. They want to control all of your email. They want to be able to read your emails and do whatever they want with them. So I highly recommend, if you have the money in your budget, to get a paid email service. I personally use Fastmail. Fastmail is excellent, their feature range is stellar, their app is wonderful, uh, but you can also integrate their email with whatever other email app you wanna use. It is a paid service, you can also bring your own domain name, you can use one of their big list of domains that they have available for you. You can do all sorts of stuff. It's just nice email hosting, and they respect your privacy, which is very rare. <laughs> Aside from Obsidian, I use an app on my phone and iPad called Drafts. Drafts is super useful for jotting things down real quick. The key feature of Drafts is that when you click the button, it opens up to a new note and the keyboard is ready to go. You just click a button and you're already ready to type. Uh, I use that for really, really quick drafting. And then I can actually export from Drafts into Obsidian. So that's a nice workflow. My video editor is LumaFusion. LumaFusion is a really easy to use but powerful video editing app. It's on iOS, so I do it primarily on my phone or iPad. Uh, I also use DaVinci Resolve if I'm doing a big serious project on my desktop. Side note with that, I use a program called Bruce Free uh, to do audio cleanup. It's a pretty sick piece of software. You give it a, a audio clip, you let it listen to the sort of background noise of the audio and it just cleans it up for you. Two more pieces of software. Discord! Discord's great. I mean, like, it's it's just like my primary communication app at this point. I use Discord all the time. I pretty much always have it up. It's, it's Discord. And lastly, my to-do manager. I use Todoist. I found Todoist to be actually really, really flexible and it has great features around building custom filters to sort of scan through all of your to-dos, pull everything that might be relevant for a specific you know, day or project or whatever, and dump it all out. You can get really malleable with it. You can invite people and have shared lists. You can use a board view or a list view. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it, and it's really cheap to boot, so nice piece of software. An excellent alternative to Todoist is todo.txt, which is a local file-based to-do schema. It is not necessarily a piece of software. There's just software that all speaks todo.txt. Uh, if you just Google todo.txt, you'll find out what I'm talking about. Part three, dark magic. I could do a whole video on dark magic, but I'm just gonna skim over this stuff a little bit. Um, so the first thing that I've got is I have a NAS on my home network. What does that mean? It is just a box with hard drives in it, and it stores data on my network. The NAS that I have has a pretty nice front end. You can actually just like, go to a website, basically, and it presents you with like a fake desktop. You can install services and apps. You can run like Plex Media Server on it. You can do all sorts of stuff, but really it's like having a personal cloud. I actually have periodic backups on all of my devices that go to my NAS. And the NAS itself is running in a mode where there are two hard drives in there and they are backing each other up. So if one of those hard drives fails, the other one can still go on. NASes, NAS I? NACE can range from small and cheap to massive and extremely expensive and they can be used for home purposes, office purposes, really anything. I recommend it, again, if you have the willpower and budget. Getting really into the dark magic here, I make heavy use of a service software of a thing called Tailscale. Bear with me. Tailscale is basically a piece of software you can install on all of your devices, servers, whatever. You then authenticate and it generates a VPN. It connects all of your devices directly over a fake network. What does that even do or mean? Well, for one, there's a nice little feature built in where, much like AirDrop, you can just 
send a file to any other machine that you have connected via tail scale. It just goes to there and it's awesome. It's really, really convenient. But as a nerd, this means that I can directly access any of my devices from any other device, regardless of where I am in the world. This is a direct connection, effectively. It's not like I'm going through, you know, a cloud sync to access files. I can just connect directly to my computer and pull a file off of it. And I can do that from any network in the world, because Tailscale has made a fake virtual network for just my devices. This is extremely convenient, and I can't really explain why without getting into a bunch of much more weird details. But let's talk about one of those details. For the times that I do want to do any kind of serious development on my iPad, uh, I will SSH into a remote server. What does that mean? It just means I'm using a terminal to log into either a server in the cloud or one of my devices on my Tailscale network. What this lets me do is write code and access the power of that remote machine and do whatever I need to do. I wish I could do all this development directly on my iPad, but they lock it down pretty tight. Even though there's a good chip in there, I have a hard time accessing the exact development setup that I would like to have access to. So instead, I can just remote in to my desktop, basically, and just code on my desktop through my iPad. So that's nice. Yay. For coding, I use software called Vim. I'm not gonna get into that. If you've heard of it, you'll understand. <laughs> it's effectively deep nerd text editor. And I think that about covers it. I've got my phone, my laptop, which is an iPad, my computer. I connected them all together using Tailscale. I have a handful of apps that I use on a daily basis, not including social media and just apps for fun like YouTube or whatever. And I do all sorts of random computing tasks depending on where I am. There is no one way to do computing properly and you don't need to have a specific type of hardware or software to do it. You don't need to have a big beefy computer and a big ridiculous iPad. You just need whatever device you have that you're watching this on and you can probably do some computing on that. So don't listen to any kind of gatekeepers. Don't listen to anyone who tells you you should use a specific operating system. They all have pros and cons. They all have a lot of cons typically, but there's a solution for everyone. And for me in this moment right now, my solution looks like an iPhone, an iPad, a Windows desktop, networking them all together, and then having a couple of remote servers to do random crap with. I also have my work computer, but that's a work computer. That's, that's separate. Thank you for watching. I hope that you learned something or at least found this interesting or entertaining, or at least I filled some random time. Thanks for sticking with me. I'll talk to you later. Be well.